joining us today. Um, as Kathy mentioned, uh, Smith and Howard, we do do uh, various breakfasts, um, trying to find the hot topics for not for profits. Um, and we're looking um, to do one depending on if we can all get together probably in the last quarter of the year. So be on the lookout uh, for that. Um, on the agenda that we have today, uh, the first three bullet points I'm going to walk through. We're going to talk about nonprofit financial reporting landscape, the warning signs around financial stability, uh, some best practices. That's probably where I'll spend the majority of my time on some financial modeling, um, some tools that we have uh, to help organizations try to uh, manage and, and look at their financial um, abilities in the future. And then I'm going to turn it over to Randy a structured communication approach and the impact that COVID can be having on our financial reporting. So the nonprofit, you know, financial reporting landscape. I'm going to assume that nobody on this webinar predicted that we were going to have a pandemic. Um, you probably did not include that within your budgets and your cash flow forecasting because um, we're seeing well thought out strategic plans that are pretty much meaningless um, at this point. Budgets are, are being redone. So now is the time for crisis rewriting business plans, the communication strategy. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm going to go over some tools for some financial modeling. But before that, on the screen, we have some statistics. I'm just going to point out a few of these. 50% of US-based nonprofits have less than one month of operating reserves which is as you know having one month of operating uh reserves you know is a concern financial liquidity what we're seeing with non with nonprofits and decreases in in revenue that we're seeing how is the organization managing you know to get through this pandemic and we're going to talk about that um 33% of US-based nonprofits have a plan to deal you know, with a recession. You know, most nonprofits were not um, planning this, did not you know, see this coming for the impact that it was going to have. 56% uh, uh, approval rate for the nonprofit uh, pandemic loans that are, are coming out there. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've heard the PPP loans um, and some of the other uh, funding, but PPP is the one that we're hearing about the most. And then 75% of nonprofits have adjusted their message in the current fundraising appeals to acknowledge the, the pandemic, which is important as you're giving your message to your donors, how's the pandemic and what you're doing uh, to help those in need and the impact to the organization. So on the next slide, the changing the business landscape. You know, the coronavirus has definitely impacted non-for-profits. Uh, you know, many are seeing a reduction in their funding from contributions. Per the Chronicle of Philanthropy, 73% of charities worldwide are seeing declines in the contributions. And studies, uh, and Kathy uh, reported this at our non-for-profit uh, conference for the, through the Georgia Society of CPAs that 30% of donors are not planning to give this fall. For a lot of nonprofits, contributions are at the highest normally at year end. So if they're expecting, are they budgeting for a 30% um, decrease in, in their plans? Um, hopefully they are, are looking at that. And you've probably seen the Georgia, the headlines, decrease in the funding in the state budget, 14%. Um, so we're probably going to see probably between 14 and 18% for nonprofits receiving less money. If it, you are a nonprofit that receives and depends heavily on some of the state and federal funding, you got to be thinking, how is this going to impact uh, my budgets when my grants and contracts are up for renewal? Uh, that's, it's a pretty significant hit. Other factors that are changing, changing the landscape. Canceled, postponed fundraising events. Uh, April and May are huge months for nonprofit events. 
So I'm getting pushed back to the last quarter um, of the year, which can still be questionable whether we will come together as large crowds. Uh, fatigue donors, uh, your, you know, donors are getting asked a lot for uh, donations and more communication. And now we're having limited interaction with our donors and our vol volunteers for those services. On the next slide, uh, governance. You know, we're seeing an increase accounting for accuracy and integrity in business operations. I mean, you need to structure your message for the virus. You know, as Kathy mentioned, impact was a big buzzword. And now that's more important than ever as you're structuring your message for the impact donors uh, what is the impact that you're having, you know, on the, on the community, especially during this pandemic and the need for those services and the importance for you to continue that impact um, as we make it through this pandemic. Um, heightened expectation of boards. I don't know if we have any uh, board members uh, on this call, but this is now's the time for board members that need to be and should be more involved uh, more than ever especially, you know, the treasurer, you know, cash flow projections and budgetings are happening more often. They're not something that we can look at, you know, once a month or on a quarterly basis. And, you know, depending on the size of the nonprofit, sometimes it is the treasurer that is putting together these, these projections. So making sure that the board is actively involved and especially your treasurer, as you are looking at these financial projections and, and looking at the future. I mean, it's, you have to have multiple people involved in the process. So some warning signs for nonprofits. Going concern. Going concern is a word that auditors like to throw around and However, it is management's responsibility to evaluate if the organization has the ability to continue as a going concern for the next 12 months. And some of the factors that need to be kind of considered, and we've got some questions on this slide and the next slide, that talks about which way is your nonprofit trending? Are you experiencing insufficient working capital? Uh, using up line of credit, or we're seeing maxing out on the line of credit debt covenant violations. Uh, organizations, if you're a 1231 year in, you may have been in compliance with your debt covenants at 1231. Then subsequent to year end when the pandemic hit, now we are no longer in compliance with our debt covenants. What does that do um, to our financials? Can we get a waiver? What is, what is our plan to get back into compliance? Is there a decrease in net assets? you know, from operations? Are we seeing continuous losses? Are we getting into a deficit into our net assets? And negative operating cash flows. We're gonna talk about some tools about monitoring cash flows. If we get into net negative operating cash flows, it's a huge indicator. Are we spending more money than we're bringing in? On the next slide, uh, Organizations, endowments, and investments. Uh, we're seeing organizations that have these items and what has happened after year end and the stock market is taking a big hit and it's slowly making its way um, back, but we just never know. It seems day to, day to day, it's going up, up and down. And I've had quite a few discussions with clients about looking at their endowments, looking at their spending policies, looking to change you know, their spending policies because now we have less contributions coming in. Now we've got to try to find ways to fund operations and having those endowments um, are there. I just caution as if you're looking to do anything outside of your normal spending policy, you've got to make sure that you're doing it with prudence. Some of this turns not to be more of an accounting issue, but a legal um, issue as there are laws to protect the endowments that donors have have given. Um, updating the new liquidity uh, footnote disclosures within the nonprofit, you know, financial statements under the new ASU, there is a liquidity footnote that will be included in all 
um, audit, audited financial statements for nonprofits. It tells the reader a lot more about nonprofit liquidity. This is a note a lot of people are going to, to look at the financial health of the organization because it can show what kind of funding do you have for general expenditures? How many days of cash on hand? And what does that represent? And then is there sufficient financial resources to support net assets with donor restrictions? You know, if we look at, I look at a non-for-profit's net asset balance and we say we have with donor restrictions of $100,000. And then I go and look at the assets and we've got $50,000 in cash and 10,000 in receivables. Well, what happened to the 40,000 of, do of donor restricted assets that I'm showing I did not use yet? Do they need to be replenished? Organate organizations that are using donor restricted dollars for other purposes, uh, for operating purposes, uh, can get into cash flow issues and concerns pretty quickly because when it comes time to be able to use those donor dollars for that specific purpose, they're no longer there. So some best practices going forward. Cash is king. Cash is, is everything. Uh, we want to make sure that we're managing our programs, you know, with agil agility and being prudent and forward thinking when we are planning and doing conservative, you know, financial management, looking what are our strengths, what are our, what are our weaknesses. So we've got to develop a 12 month cash flow projection. And I would say 12 months is at least a minimum. If you can, I would recommend 24 months. But on the next slide, I have an example of a cash flow projection. Now you may need to squint <laughs> uh, to be able uh, to see some of this information, but this is the best way I could get the um, Excel into the presentation. But we will be having uh, some of these uh, templates will be available on the Georgia Center for Not-for-Profits uh, website um, after this presentation today. But this is one example of a rolling cash uh, projection. So what we do is we start with our beginning cash. We budget out what are our revenues and what are our expenses. And we do that for the entire year. As each month goes by, we update for actual. Hopefully for what we had budgeted versus our, our actual, that they're, they're pretty similar but that's not always the case. You know, we, can, we look at expenses. Expenses are probably a little easier to predict where some of our expenses, what some of our, our salaries are gonna be, bank, uh, bank fees. Um, what's a little bit harder is on the revenue side. If we have contributions, when do we expect contributions? Maybe we have a grant that has multi-year payments and we can expect to receive that in, in one month. You know, federal grants, we need to be budgeting if we expect a 14% you know, de decrease. When it comes to revenues, you have to be conservative. You've got to be realistic uh, you know, with these numbers because I've seen so many times with a cash flow projection, we're going to try to at least you know uh, break even and not turn into a deficit and you, you could kind of run into problems and you can see by month as things are getting projected on this on the worksheet you got your ending cash balance and you can see i have a couple cells that are highlighted red these are warnings warning signs as an organization is looking and projecting cash flow ahead those red signs, you don't want to wait until you're in the month of, you know, let's say November, that we're going to have negative, you know, cash, we've got to look to see what decisions do we have to make now. So we don't end up, you know, with negative cash, are we going to be able to pay our payroll in November, you don't want to wait to that point. And every month that you update your revenue and your expenses, you can look, look forward to see, okay, I'm going to be in trouble in four months if I can't increase the revenue line or I have to decrease the expenses. 
On the next slide, this is just another cash flow, you know, projection model. This is coming from the nonprofit finance fund on their website. They have a lot of um, good tools um, to start with that you can tailor uh, for your organization. And it's kind of does a lot of the similar things. It goes ahead and takes it uh, by month. Here's our projected. And then each month you update it for what is actual. And it, you can, things that you need to think about is incorporating what funds are we going to be taking from our line of credit. Uh, capital campaign uh, funding, there's a line um, for that. When budgeting, if you have donor restricted funds, making sure you're managing those dollars and not using those for operations, but using those. Uh, for, for program costs, and so making sure to monitor those separate and what those are going to do for your cash flow projections. So this is just an, another tool that's out there. On the next slide, it's another tool from the Nonprofit Finance uh, Fund that is out there. It's a budget scenario, scenario tool. You know, as I mentioned before, um, budgets, you know, have been thrown out the window and they're being redone on a regular basis. Having one budget is not enough anymore. Reforecasting is happening more and more. So in this tool, it provides, here's the budget that was approved. Here's the actuals to date. And then it shows we have in that column E a reforecasting. Um, what is and what are our various assumptions? If we're assuming we're going to obtain, you know, additional funding, or maybe we're going to assume we're going to be able to reduce uh, some certain type of expenses, you can include that in there. But having one budget is not enough anymore. You need to have multiple scenarios. You need to have a best case scenario. You have to have a worst case scenario. And then you need to see based upon, since the future is so unknown, do I need to have multiple scenarios for if this happens or if this doesn't happen? If you take a university, for example, they need to have multiple budgets. Well, what if students do come back uh, to campus? What will they need? Well, what if there's uncertainty? We're not gonna bring students back on campus in the fall, student housing revenue. What is the impact of that? Organizations that have programs with summer you know, summer programs, um, they're looking, well, maybe we can't do it in June, but maybe we open up uh, in July. And if they're after school programs, what, what's going to happen? Um, you need to have multiple budgets and multiple scenarios and be realistic. Here's what we think is best case and worst case. And if the worst case scenario does happen, what impact, you know, does that have? On the, on the organization, because things are moving fast with a pandemic and changing on a regular basis. On the next tab, liquidity management and best practices. So in addition to some cash flow uh, projection scenarios, another way to monitor and is to develop financial ratios. And these three that I have on my, on the screen right now are good ones for liquidity management. Our current ratio, our months of cash on hand, which we call our survival time and debt coverage ratio. So on the next line, I've got an example and it's a little easier uh, to see these ratios and the examples. So if we take an organization with a debt coverage ratio, which is your changing your net assets, your total debt service with your principal and interest, your target is that you want it to be greater than one. Greater than one means that your business is generating enough income to pay its debts. So for example, we have this ABC nonprofits in 2019 had a 1.15 uh, debt coverage ratio. What that means is that this organization is making 15% more income than you need to cover your debts. Less than one means 
the organization does not have the ability to pay their debts in full. So this is why you see in debt covenants, you may have a debt coverage uh, ratio. This is what they're looking at. What is your ability to pay back that debt? Uh, current ratio, current assets divided by current liabilities. Recommend a two to one or over 200%. Uh, so over 200% is a pr pretty healthy organization. A ratio that is less than one may indicate liquidity problems for a company. And then days of cash on hand. This ratio, otherwise known as your survival time. If you take your cash, cash equivalents, divided by your average cash per day. So if you take your total expenses divided by 365 days, how many days of cash on hand does the organization have? It's recommended to have a cushion of six months of cash on hand. Um, and as we saw, a lot of organizations have less than 30 days of operating reserves, um, not including what kind of, what kind of cash uh, do we have on, have on hand? Because it's gonna show what is our, our survival time as not-for-profits are getting into uh, the pandemic, if you have 30 days of cash on hand, then you may only have, you know, thir 30 days. You got to make some hard, hard decisions after that. On the next slide, some, we've got liquidity management, best practices, time to obtain cash is now, which is easier said than done as we're kind of in a pandemic and there's not a whole lot of um, options. You know, talk to your donors that are uh, passionate about your, about your mission. Um, they're the ones that can help various grants and things. Um, but, you know, it, it, there's limited, uh, you know, op opportunity, not as much opportunity as there was before the pandemic to try to bring cash in. Uh, managing uh, receivables and managing the timing of payables. You know, obtaining, um, whether you have a line of credit or the PPP loan. Um, you know, the, we're, we're still seeing, I just got an email earlier uh, today about a client who finally got approved for the PPP loan. So they're still slowly uh, coming in but that only gets you so far with it to cover only an eight week period. So it's not like we're gonna to come to July one, snap our fingers and the pandemic is gone and the economy is, is back to normal. So making sure that when we're doing financial projections and looking into, uh, looking into the future, the PPP money is a short term fix to help put those plans into place. Uh, monitor liquidity and availability of resources. Uh, look at that footnote that you have. If you have audited financial statements, don't use the line of credit uh, to fund structural deficits and making sure to keep monitoring your debt covenants, your financial and non-financial to make sure that you uh, remain in compliance. Uh, next tab strategies for mitigating uh, revenue loss, you got to understand where your revenues are, where the vulnerability is. Do you need to evaluate uh, programs that are not mission critical? Services to your clients need to change with the pandemic. Um, we, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, changes to pro programs. Um, looking at pricing models you know, for earned income, does that need to change for individuals to afford them? And organizations that do have earned income are getting hit hard because there's nobody to buy um, their services, you know, especially if you're looking at arts and culture. When are we going to have um, a time where, you know, we could come together, you know, to watch a show or a museum? Um, we're just not going to be able to have as many people um, as we have had in the past. What is the impact to that earned revenue? So on the next slide, uh, revenue, the reliability of the revenue streams. So there's some questions here uh, that are on the screen for a non for profits to evaluate their financial strengths, you know, and their weaknesses. 
Is your revenue mix relatively predictable and reliable? Government contracts, as we talked about, state budget cuts, you know, 14% at a minimum. Uh, you know, for the state of Georgia, so that will impact a lot of nonprofits. Uh, major donors, you know, are they reliable? Do you have a, a lot of your ma uh, major donors, or do you have a lot more contributions uh, that come in smaller in nature from a large number of donors? Uh, is their support going to be continued um, at the current levels? Um, board members. Um, what can the board um, do to help any funding, any, any losses, any additional resources, and making sure, I mean, the fundraising message, um, your strongest and most urgent case um, for success is, is important that you're changing your message uh, for the pandemic. On the next tab, profitability and, and liquidity, you know, how might changes in revenue streams or expenses affect your bottom line. Liquidity, you know, what cash is readily available for emergency needs? Um, so some of these questions that are here, where is it do you need to, to focus? Then on the next tab, liquidity management and best practices. Yeah, we recommend regularly monitoring profit and losses by program. After you've gone through and allocated your overhead costs to all programs, then determine projected shortfalls that will be covered through programs, you know, need to be discontinued. Uh, recommend that your organization regularly perform, you know, business model to properly utilize funds that have restricted, you know, by time or purpose. Again, financial modeling, putting, putting plans together trying to predict the future, which is not always easy to do, will help an organization weather the storm uh, that is ahead of them. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Randy, who is going to discuss the importance of reserves. Randy. Thank you, Kimberly. And good morning to everyone out there for the Georgia Center for Nonprofits, all the members out there. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm gonna be talking about reserves and Normally when you think the word reserve, you think about a rainy day fund. And with COVID-19, that rainy day is definitely here and now. Kimberly mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we're seeing about 50% of the nonprofits out there have about one month of operating reserves. So probably most of the people on this webinar are probably gonna fall into one of two buckets. Number one, maybe you're a newer non-for-profit and haven't had a chance to build up those reserves yet or haven't developed a formal reserve policy. Or maybe you're with an organization that does have maybe a more prudent board and they were able to set aside funds for that rainy day. But what we're seeing is now with the COVID-19, you know, organizations are dipping into that reserve fund. They're probably using most, if not all of those funds at this point. So we're seeing a scarcity of program funding. And many nonprofits think that they don't have enough funding to build a reserve, but that's just not true. It is possible to create an operating reserve even when the financial situation is tight. When you go through this process of preparing a reserve policy, remember to use those best practices that Kimberly just described. You should identify which programs that continue to have full funding and which programs are subsidized by the rest of the organization. This is an opportunity then to move staff and expenses to the funded programs and make cuts where necessary. Now, nonprofits should not let the statement, we just don't have enough money, be a stopping point. So with strategic reserves, a plan can be created and enacted over time. So if you're gonna develop that reserve policy, the conventional wisdom may say, well, I'm just gonna use an unsophisticated approach. Maybe it's three, six, 12 months, maybe it's a percent of budget or, you know, this amount just seems right. But really your organization's unique. You're gonna have different risk exposures, different financial circumstances. So your reserve level really should be unique as well. And here, benchmarking against your peers, that's not gonna be helpful. So we're gonna go ahead and walk through three types of reserves. The first one, um, it's definitely 
the first reserve bucket is we're going to see where the weekly cash burn rate is needed to fund basic day-to-day -day operations and your working capital. And then the second reserve bucket, here's where COVID-19 scenario unfortunately um, would appear because it definitely falls into the unplanned, undesirable events. Here we're seeing operations with significant risk exposure. are gonna need more reserves and liquidity than those that operate in a much more stable environment. And then the third reserve, this is where possible funding for a new strategic program opportunity may be more evident during this current environment that may actually better fulfill your mission in the short and or long term. To create reserves, we recommend first performing a five-year financial forecast, which should include identified and quantified specific revenue and spending risk. Then establish the appropriate funding approach strategy. We have three options here. First one is in your, your annual um, results. The years that you have more revenue than expense, go ahead and set those, side, those funds aside for future um, reserves and go ahead and designate those. Another option is, is through your annual budget process, go ahead and put a line on in there to just call it funding reserve. You're gonna pay yourself just like you were any other vendor. Then the third option, which probably has more of an impact in the short term now with COVID-19 is actually approaching uh, current and potential funders for a one-time funding request. We recommend developing the reserve policy to help you build the reserve, which could then provide guidelines on how to spend the reserve. This policy will help you accomplish your goal and stay on track. Now, if you don't already have a funding reserve policy, um, Now's the time to use this template to memorialize the discussions you're already having right now with your board. So what we'll do is we'll walk through this template, and this is from the Fiscal Management Associates, and this will help you customize a policy that works for your organization. Uh, this is just gonna be a blueprint for your organization's policy. And you'll need to customize, at a minimum, the sections written here in light blue. And walk through, there's actually eight pro tips that they call them within the template. Tip number one, reflect on why your organization needs an operating reserve and identify a few clear objectives. This policy here actually has a few to kind of consider as a starting point. First one it provides is to create an internal line of credit to manage cash flow and maintain financial flexibility. The second one is probably under COVID-19 to enable the organization to sustain operations through delays in payments of committed funding. And then third, you may wanna consider um, a reason to have the policy as one that you could pay for one-time non-recurring expenses that'll help you uh, build capacity to be more, to be in a more strategic, um, to be a more strategic, strategic organization. And then remember the intention of this policy is that it be used and that the, then the funding be replenished. Two and three, to determine the appropriate amount of reserves to have on hand for your organization, start by evaluating the organization's revenue and spending risk factors. Revenue risk factors are those that make your revenue inconsistent. Spending risk factors are those that make it difficult for your organization to adjust or scale back operations. Tip number four, there really, unfortunately, there's not just one funding plan that's gonna work for all organizations. We really recommend considering the three funding strategies that I just went through for you to create your reserves. Tip number five, you'll then need to consider where and how you will invest the reserves once they're obtained. Tip number six, plan for how your organization will replenish its reserves during the shortfall. And separately, be sure to disclose within your audit financial statement any net assets without donor restrictions that may now be board designated. In order to guarantee the long-term financial stability of your organization, be sure to carefully manage how the reserves are used. COVID-19 will necessitate frequently working with your board 
and your treasurer based upon frequent cash projections. Tip number seven, most organizations allow the executive director to access reserves with just committee or maybe treasurer approval if the amount is below a defined limit and the payback period is within a set number of months. When requests are above that established threshold, usually the executive director will need the full board or an executive committee approval. Lastly, tip number eight, your reserve policy is a living document that should continue to reflect the circumstances facing your organization over time. You really wanna review it at least every year at a minimum. Let's talk about a structured communication approach. The Chronicle of Philanthropy put out what they recommend be a, a very prudent communication approach. And this is intended to reassure your donors that you have a prudent plans for the future and that your cause is operating from a place of optimism despite the current uncertainty. You wanna share financial contingency plans to give donors confidence that you can weather a financial decline. It is critical to be transparent with your donor communications about your contingency plan, whether it be tapping into an endowment or your reserves, Perhaps you're gonna partner with other nonprofits to streamline services, or maybe you're temporarily freezing non-essential services. This statement should address how you're gonna be making up any lost revenue, how you're gonna be cutting expenditures, paying back any loan, and eventually reinstating programs and services, and maybe asking more from your donors post this crisis. The five steps are number one, provide data consistently and quickly. Number two, the metrics should matter. Number three, communicate the right level of quantity and complexity. Step number four, share the good and the bad. And number five, these conversations should really be a two-way street. Make sure you're listening and responding. As always, be sure to maintain transparency throughout this current crisis. Establish a culture of transparency for effective governance. Now financial reporting. From a financial reporting perspective, how will COVID-19 affect your audited financial statements? The organization has a December 31 year end. This will be a significant subsequent event. If you're a June 30 year end, the eight weeks of spending a PPP loan may or may not expire in time as of June 30th to determine if a PPP loan is forgiven or not. This possible loan forgiveness could have a very significant impact on your financials. So an auditor coming in after the fact, they're gonna to have to consider if an additional emphasis of a matter paragraph is necessary because it's their audit opinion and they may need this additional paragraph within their audit opinion. Even though this, opinion, this paragraph is not required, it is a possibility depending on how significant the virus has impacted your organization. It's also dependent on auditor's judgment. But here's some example wording how that may look as an additional paragraph within your auditor's opinion. It could say, in March 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. While it's not possible for the organization to predict the duration or magnitude of the adverse results of the outbreak of COVID-19 and its effects on results of operations at this time, the organization does anticipate it will have an effect on operations in fiscal 2020. <clears throat> You'll also refer the user to a footnote within the audit statements where more information will be provided. That additional footnote may have a title called something like contingent financial matter you'll want to do is describe possible future developments which could impact your organization. You can also report if a PPP or SBA loan is obtained and the current status if this loan has been approved or forgiven. Debt covenants should also be continually monitored, as Kimberly mentioned, even after year end. But note then should also report any decline in revenues or and or investments. If your organization has been impacted from a revenue standpoint, some sample wording may include something like, 
The foundation's spring fundraiser has been postponed. In addition, the foundation's revenues may be negatively impacted due to reduced customer traffic, reduced demand for services, and the temporary reduction of operations. If impacted, sample wording could include as a result of liquidity, volatility experienced since COVID-19, since in this case, it was a December 31 year end, the market value of the foundation's investments has decreased by approximately, and we're seeing 1231 clients that are issuing in May be impacted by between five and 10%, but you have to look through that through whatever the audit opinion date is. During this pandemic, donors will likely be spending more time online looking for updated news. So think creatively about how to get their attention through impact stories and status updates. You may want to consider repurposing previous stories. Always be resourceful. You want to tell your amazing story. Continue to look at your social media. Match your story with your target audience's platform choice, no matter what that is. Don't forget about your previous marketing materials. The print and emails are still could, could be effective depending on the medium choice of your potential donor. Your website. Have you been refreshing it lately to tell your current story, how you've been impacted by COVID-19? The 990, the IRS Form 990. We know it's readily available, but is it easily available for potential donors? Is it on your website? And then finally, your audit financial statement. Often this is neglected as an opportunity for tell your story, all the great things you're doing, all your accomplishments. This should be within your footnotes. And make sure this is also on your website. And thank you everybody. I wanna say that this recorded presentation, the slides, the cash flow projection Excel documents that Kimberly went through, the reserve policy template that I went through, they're all gonna be made available soon maybe as soon as tomorrow on the Georgia Center for Nonprofits website. And I know Kimberly and I are gonna be available for questions now via chat. I think Kathy's been helping us out on that. But as always, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Here's our contact information here at Smith & Howard. So thank you very much. And I do thank say you that- Thank very much. Go ahead, Kimberly. Sorry. Okay. I was just going to say, I do see one question that, had, uh, that came in from the group chat asking yep. if we're seeing short term increase of nonprofit donations as the community feels the need and if there is a near term window to move up fundraising now versus waiting until the end of the year uh, that is recommended. Um, what we're seeing uh, for clients, it kind of depends. For clients that are in the, the critical, uh, what we call critical services, the critical needs that are needed right now, especially when you're talking um, like food, food services and uh, social ser services, we're seeing some increase, not necessarily from individual donations, but you're seeing a lot of organizations that are giving uh, grants such as, uh, you know, the community a uh, foundation has given it a large number of grants and as well as other organizations. So we see an increase in those to help with some of those critical needs um, that we're seeing. But again, that's coming from various foundations. And what we're seeing, and these um, was a discussion, so these are uh, what Kathy had noted, is that we're not seeing organizations, if you don't already have an existing relationship with the foundation. They're not looking to give funding to ones that they don't already have um, an existing uh, relationship to. But and Kathy, Kimberly, I don't know if you see anything different? Yeah. Go ahead, Kathy. Well, I would no. I was going to. I I think that's accurate. I think we tried um, giving Tuesday on when was that may 5th 11th whatever that was giving tuesday we tried that to see if we couldn't bump up some early fundraising and i say it was okay it was adequate it didn't blow our socks off um, but it wasn't terrible either some organizations did really well but they worked it really hard so that probably that was our test with it i was actually going to switch conversations 
I see there's another question up. Switch the conversation to reserve policies. I get a lot of questions about should I, can I zero out my reserves? Can I use them fully up? Or do you recommend hiding some or saving some, which means I might have to do furloughs or layoffs earlier so that I have something for fall left over or just sort of guidance on how far down do you take the reserves? And then what if you can't build them up again this year, same fiscal year? Yeah, what we're seeing is many people are kind of hesitant to dive into will build up reserves. I think, you know, that rainy day, I don't see it pouring rain, but I think many of us on this webinar do see it pouring rain. So we do, I think the, the key here is the build up, the intent to build up a, an endowment or reserve is so you have it to spend when needed. And now is definitely time to spend it. And I think the key is as long as there's a well thought out policy approved by your board, that there's a plan in place to replenish it. You definitely don't want to just take it down to zero and be done with it, but think about in the future. Okay, if I take out this, what can I do in the future then to replenish it? Mm -hmm. And putting that into your budget when you're doing your cash flow uh, forecasting and using your budget in, as I said, have a tw at least a 12 month uh, rolling budget and incorporate that in, into, into that plan and is how it's going to be replenished. Okay. So here's the question on arts organization. Um, their income has dropped to zero, earned income. They've got three months reserves. They have no debt. Um, they just got an email from the SBA that they could apply for the disaster, the EIDL loan, because they have no employees, so they're not eligible for PPP. Rent is a huge thing. So should they take out a loan? Because the disaster money is not forgivable. It is a true loan. Mm -hmm. Should they be taking out a loan? Three months reserve and no debt. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's a tough question. Now, the EIDL is a good way if you don't have kind of a line of credit. Um, it is not forgivable, but it is, you know, at a pretty uh, low rate. And the payback um, time will help uh, to get through uh, this time period. So I've got a couple of uh, organizations that I work with that don't have employees um, that couldn't apply for the PPP loan that did use the EIDL loan um, for um, to help for some of those operating. You just got to minimum, minimize how many, ex you know, the expenses that you have and look to see will this care, how long will that carry you if you do get the EIDL loan and how is the organization going to be able you know, to pay it back? And I've had a couple of clients actually question whether they should get this really from an op, um, optics standpoint. They're worried if the AJC should have their name of their organization and their executive director's name and the amount of the loan that they obtained. You know, is that going to look good or bad? I've, I've cautioned that they're really just doing what's best for their organization for the long term financial stability of it. Even if um, I know you were talking about. Um, not having the option of being forgivable, but even if a loan, if it's loan, low interest rate, you need cash now, you need that cash influx. So that's very smart, very prudent. And I think the key is being able to tell your story. How have you been impacted? In this example, the arts, you know, your doors are closed, revenues are zero. You wanna to continue to provide benefit for a long-term basis to the uh, patrons in the Atlanta community. So you're doing what's right for, for your organization. Thank you. Are there other questions? Anybody? You're welcome. You can also, we have a few minutes, you can unmute yourself and ask it if it's too hard to type up. Um, anything else we can answer? What about the, so I'm going to ask another one. I get a lot of questions. I've got six months of reserves. I'm going to be spending it down. Should I go get a line of credit now? and maybe use a line of credit instead of spending down my reserves? How do you balance the two? And I mean a traditional line of credit, not, not for the CARES Act loan. I give it. Usually with line of credits, you know, the key of getting a line of credit is before you need one. That's easily said yeah. and done at this point. But if you do have one, I, I, I've seen a lot of people pulling down, you know, fully, just so they have that cash on hand 
because they're afraid if you know if these banks are giving out long large funding they may not have the cash on hand in the future um, to pull it down and the key is having a good relationship with your bank as well maybe they can caution you as well great thank you there's another comment where they have to sign off but they took lots of notes to share with their board of directors so what about so another thing people ask what do you think boards should be meeting during this time period? I mean, it's once a month, quarterly. That's been the standard for boards. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing boards meet more often, take a more active interest as of the finances? Yes. Uh, I would say, you know, the, the regular time uh, frame is, is not enough. Uh, may not need to be a more a full, uh, you know, committee meeting, but communication needs to be you know, increase. And it also depends on the organization and the impact. You know, if there's, uh, if this is such, you know, a critical time of monitoring what our revenues and what our expenses are, I would say, you know, we're seeing some meeting weekly, some meeting every other week. And at a minimum, the board treasurer, maybe the finance committee, you know, those should be very active at this point. Mm -hmm. So, um, overall forecast impact on fundraising for 2021, what you to advise down by five to 10, not 14 to 30 like the rest of 2020. And are you seeing data on 2021 fundraising? All the stuff I'm seeing is still on 2020. Mm -hmm. I've not really seen forecast, um, in a lot of the revenue analysis tools, they actually have you go funder by funder. So foundation by foundation, government contract by government contract, major gift by major gift, and really estimate out to 2021 at a um, percentage, you know, highly likely to get, somewhat likely, unlikely. Look at it from that perspective and come up with your numbers. I think we're still waiting to see how far down this depression recession thing is. The underlying economy is going to dictate a lot of what fundraising looks like in 2021. The key is getting back open. And okay. you know, when can we get back open yeah. in the short term? Mm -hmm. Right. I think that 2020, I think we're telling people 20 to 40%. I think 14 to 30 is like, again, how much money nonprofits raise and the government cuts put in. If you combine the two, we think it's as high as 20 um, and more like it could be as high as 40. I'm just responding to the question. Uh, another question? Anyone else? Great question. I know lots of you are responsible to see from the sign on for the finances of your organization. So please be sure and reach out. We'll get the templates to you because I know you're probably all looking forward to using them. But anything else we can ask for you as you're trying to wind through this and figure out what to do or recommend to your CEOs for your organization? All right. 